few months ago, Julie and I were able to sneak away for a night to Stillwater. And if you've ever been to Stillwater, it's, it's an absolutely gorgeous town. It is an antique collector's dream because it seems like every other store that you walk into is an antique store. Um, it is also um, a very good place if you are into walks or if you're into jogs because there's a lot of good trails out there and just beautiful environment to, uh, to be out in. And uh, if you're really crazy, you can burn your thighs into next year by taking the stairway challenge, okay? There is this, uh, uh, where we were staying at this hotel, there's a stairway that was just right next to our hotel. And, and I, I have a picture up there, and that's just part of it. And that's just like the first section there. And uh, we had already walked around everywhere in Stillwater, and we were going back to our hotel, and we come to that stairway, and we look at it, and we, we read about it, and, and uh, saw that it would actually present a physical challenge, and so naturally her and I would say, let's do it. And so we, we did it. We started climbing, and the first section was, was sort of a breeze. The second section, has anybody ever climbed the stairway before, by the way? You have, Samuel. It's, it's a workout. And so by the second section, you're, you're starting to feel like it. Halfway through, we're starting to think, golly, where is the end of this stairway? And, you know, I mean, Julie and I, we're not marathon runners, but we're certainly no slouches either. I mean, we're in, we're in decent shape for the most part. And, uh, but uh, we finally got to the top, and we could hardly feel our thighs at that point. Uh, but when you get to the top, there's something that, uh, that is right up there called the Scenic Overlook, where you basically look over the whole town of Stillwater, and you see the St. Croix River and just in all of its beauty. And I, w- I would assume that just around this time of year, it would be uh, wonderful to see with all the, the trees changing as well. And when you're looking out over the Scenic Overlook, you sort of forget about everything that you just went through in the last 10 minutes. But then you also realize that somehow you got to get down the same way that you came up. And so it is this, this adventure. But, you know, as I was thinking about it, I, I, I realized that many of us are going through life trying really hard to climb a staircase. We are... Uh, we aren't striving to get to a scenic overlook. We're trying to find peace. We're trying to find comfort. We're trying to find safety. We're trying to find protection. We're trying to find happiness. We're trying to find health and safety. Uh, in essence, we are trying to climb our way to heaven. And we're striving for these things. And when we do, we very quickly realize that our thighs are burning and there is no end in sight. And then we come to this story, this historical account of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. He was the grandson of Abraham. And he was running for his life. He had just tricked his ailing father, into giving him the blessings of God and the inheritance of the family, both of which rightfully belonged to Esau, his older brother. Esau finds out about this and realizes that everything about his future, everything about anything that he ever wanted in life has now been taken completely away from him. And he devises this plot to kill Jacob. Well, his mother gets wind of this, and and so she instructs uh, Jacob to to go away to her brother so that he can be safe until this whole thing blows over. And as he is running away, he falls asleep and encounters a stairway. Nothing like the one that that Julie and I faced in, in Stillwater. But this was a stairway that leads right into heaven with God at the top of the staircase. And as we dig in, we are going to find that along with Jacob, all of our longings and all of the restlessness that we face day in and day out are fulfilled by reaching the top of this staircase. But because we are like Jacob, 
we can't get there on our own. We can't work our way. We can't climb it. We can't buy it. We have to be taken there by someone else, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's dig in. The first thing that we need to get out of this passage is that we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. (laughs) Trust that God knows what he is doing. You know, weaved in and out of all these stories about Jacob is God's ability to make his plan and his will succeed even in the midst of uh, gross human sin and tragedy. And verses 1 through 9, it's really no different. Jacob had done a horrible thing. He deceived his dying and blind father. He stole everything that was precious to Esau's future. And to make things even weirder, his mother is the mastermind of all of this. We learn back in chapter 25, verse 28, that the family was divided. It said that, that Isaac loved Esau, and he loved him because, well, he was, a, he was a good hunter and he was a good cook. Rebecca, she loved Jacob. It was Rebecca's plan for Jacob to deceive his blind and ailing father. It was her suggestion that he get out of Dodge to go and save himself and have some sort of protection. And here in verses 1 through 5 now of chapter 28, we see her continued deception of Isaac. But first, let's back up into chapter 27, verses 43 through 44. She says to Jacob, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. So why did she want Jacob to leave and go to Haran? Because there was a hit on his head from his brother. Now in verses 1 through 5 of our text today, Isaac doesn't send Jacob out for any dire reason. There's no urgency in his voice. We find out rather why he sends him out, and it's completely different. Starting in verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, And take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. So there's no hint of urgency here. There's no, oh, my son is about to be murdered, so he might as well just start stepping here quickly. But rather, he sends him out in order to get married. And I want to argue here, and this is speculation, that Rebekah downplayed the reason for Jacob's departure with her husband. She says, get out of here quickly. Isaac says, well, why don't you just go find yourself a wife? And this is an absolutely crazy story. With every word that we read in this uh, particular narrative, we see the advancement of a dysfunction of relationships in this family and the dysfunction of character in these individual people. Yet, even in the midst of this familial chaos, God is at work. 
I've mentioned a number of times how the New Testament shines light into the whole narrative here, uh, that it was always God's plan before anything ever happened, before the world created, when God thought about how history was going to go, it was his plan that the blessings would go through uh, Jacob rather than his older brother Esau. Now look at verse 3 again. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take a possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. See, it's, very, it's a very difficult concept to grasp, but we have to try here and wrestle with it. Here we have God, the creator of the universe, the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. This is the Holy One, the one who holds the world in his hands, is sovereignly working out his plan in history through the ugliness of this family's dysfunction. And he is working his carefully programmed plan through the vessel of a cheat and a liar. And this, I want to say, is good news for you and for me. Because we are just like Jacob. We constantly screw up. We hurt other people. We get hurt ourselves. We are, we are liars. We're cheats. We're deceivers. We're thieves. Yet God chooses to draw us to himself, not because of who we are, but in spite of what we are. If we are called by God, he cuts through the messiness of our lives like a stick of butter in order that we would see his beauty and that we would be drawn irresistibly to him. We have read all of this. And if yet we were to do a deeper reading, we would click, quickly learn that Jacob here doesn't even know the Lord yet. He hasn't encountered him. God hasn't revealed himself to Jacob. He will in just a bit. But up to this point, we just see God's, uh, God's plan unfolding through this rascal, Jacob. But when he does, Jacob will never be the same. He will be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, ultimately culminating in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And God is working his plan through us as well. We need to trust that God knows what he is doing. But second, we also need to ascend the stairs. We ought to ascend the stairs. You know, I started playing guitar and started my musical life journey when I was 11 years old. And once I started becoming more proficient, uh, I just had to learn the staple songs that every guy that plays guitar as a teenager or a pre whatever you want to call them, tween, needs to learn. And uh, perhaps it, it's the same way with, with kids today. There are a couple songs that have just been in the repertoire of guitar players forever. The first one is House of the Rising Sun by The Animals. The second one is Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. You can't play guitar without learning the Stairway to Heaven. Now, the Stairway to Heaven song has certainly had its fair share of controversy uh, in the, uh, since it was first uh, written and recorded. If you were to do a Google search, as I did this week, on the meaning of Stairway to Heaven, you're going to get way more explanations and information, some plausible, some totally ridiculous, than you had ever bargained for. But a plain reading, and from interviews with Robert Plant, it is clearly a metaphorical song about people who try to get everything in life through money, including heaven. And the song is about how futile it is 
to rely on money to get ahead. And the sad reality is, is that we think we can. We, by doing good things, by avoiding the bad things, we think that we can earn our way into heaven and that those good things that we do would be the payment to God by which he would say, yes, credit accepted, and you get in. But it doesn't work that way. And if there's anyone that can prove this biblical principle, it is Jacob. I don't think I need to rehash all the character flaws that we've read about with him up to this point, but we can see in verse 10 and following what he experienced and how it led to true life transformation, true life change. He went from a person that thought that heaven was all about manipulation and cheating to a person that was completely dependent and hungry for the Lord and for more of him. Look beginning in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. So no matter how much you want to try to avoid it, two things are inevitable. The sun will always set and you're always going to need rest. Jacob has been running the, who knows if, if, uh, if it's in the fall and the sun goes down a little bit earlier or not, but he needs to rest. These are gifts from God. And he uses it now to reach this rebel rascal. In verse 12 and following, it details this dream that he had when he had a rock as his pillow. <laughs> It says, behold, he he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and, and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. Now, throughout the Old Testament, it was not uncommon uh, for the Lord to appear physically to people that he was going to do an important work with and through. And here, uh, especially through dreams, and here the Lord is appearing to Jacob for the first time. He had previously appeared to Abraham numerous times. He had appeared to Isaac numerous times. And here now he is appearing to Jacob for the first time. And likewise, Jacob had, had no doubt heard about God. He had heard the stories of his grandfather. He was alive, by the way, when, uh, when um, uh, Abraham was alive, when Jacob was born. Jacob was really about 15 when Abraham died. So he had heard the stories from Abraham. He had heard the stories from his father, Isaac. And then we see here in verse 16, Jacob having a common response to being in God's presence is being in terror and in awe. Here's what it says. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now, uh, reading this, and from reading throughout the Bible, we can say on the authority of the Bible that every occasion of Scripture, when someone truly encounters the Lord, they don't stay the same. They're different. Their lives have changed. It's no different here. Yes, we'll see that there are some of those residual issues in Jacob's life that God is going to start sanding off and working the the rough spots off of him. But from here on out, we see a man who embraces his new identity in God. We see a man who is continually getting those, those rough edges sanded off sometimes very uh, painfully, but by the grace and mercy 
of God. So, how do modern Jacobs, like you and like me, obtain this life change? How do we get redeemed from the messes that we have created because of our sin? It is to ascend the stairs and to meet God. But how do we do that? Robert Palmer was, a, uh, was absolutely right in insinuating that we can't buy a stairway to heaven. We can't. It's not possible. But what if that stairway was given to us as a gift and that we could ascend the stairway freely without charge regardless of our character flaws? Well, that stairway was indeed given to us in the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 51, when he's talking with Nathanael, he says this, Truly, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying here? He's not saying that he is at the bottom of the staircase and the angels come down from that stairway and then minister to him or to reach him there. Rather, he is saying that he is the stairway to heaven. He is the bridge from earth up to God. It is only through him that we can reach the top. Later in John 14, verse 6, Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And every single one of us are like Jacob. We're weak. We're helpless. We try our best to construct a stairway to heaven. We try to ascend it and the stairs, and we end up petering out with our thighs spiritually burning. But when you trust in the accomplished work of Christ Jesus on the cross, his sinless life, his substitutionary death, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, assuming all authority over heaven and earth and over all of the universe, your life will be changed. Your life will not be the same. It won't necessarily be easier, but you will be freed from sin's power. Through faith in him, you'll be freed to live as you were created to live. Through faith in him, you'll be freed to be absolved of all of your guilt and shame. Through him, you will not be condemned for your rebellion against God. In him, and in him alone, we have heaven and all of its glory before us. When you trust in Christ, the promise to Jacob in verse 15 will be yours. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When you trust in Christ, you have the full assurance that whatever you go through, He is with you. And He will not leave you. So what are you waiting for? The staircase is open. The work to get up it is already done in Christ's work on your behalf. So why not trust in him or return to him today and get on that stairway to heaven? And there's a third thing, is that we need to set up the stone. Set up the stone 
Whenever we truly encounter the, the, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, as I said, it, it, it leaves us with a life that is changed. That change comes only from the Lord. But there is something that we should consciously do and strive toward. And that is that we ought to strive to make our lives a living monument to God's greatness. We must set up the stones of his story in us. Look at Jacob's response here in verse 18 and following. It says, So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that place was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and I and give, will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So in verse 18, Jacob sets up a monument. Not unlike a lot of other altars that would have been set up by Abraham as he was sojourning in these areas, going from place to place, setting up altars and putting sacrifices on them on, uh, to, to the Lord. And this would have been a radically different thing uh, that he was doing because the place that he is at, this place of Luz, was sort of a pagan mecca. Everywhere that you went, there would have been monuments set up to different pagan gods of the Canaanites. And now this sojourner comes, and he claims this land that was promised to his grandfather and to his father now belongs to the Lord God. And anyone who comes by and sees this stone set up will know that this place is no longer Luz, but Bethel, which means house of God, that it belongs to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 20, Jacob makes a vow that we need to be careful not to uh, misinterpret here. It's easy to see it as a conditional statement. Well, if God does all of these things for me, well, then he'll be my God. That's not what's happening here. There's no way to, to really quantify uh, that God would do all these things and he would wait that long, but rather he is trusting in the Lord now. Instead, Jacob is saying, I've heard of this God. I've heard how great he is. I've heard of his faithfulness to my grandfather. I've heard of his goodness to my father. And now I am trusting in his steadfast love. I am trusting in his faithfulness. I am trusting in his word. And so as he goes with me, so I go with him. So do you see what's happening here? In both of these things, his vow and his monument, he is claiming that the Lord is his God and that he wants the world to know about it. And that's exactly what we are called to in Jesus. We are not called to lay out physical stones and call it Bethel, the house of God. Because when we trust in Christ, his spirit, his dwelling place, becomes us. His spirit resides in us. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, Ephesians 2, and 1 Peter chapter 2 all clearly show that you and I are now Bethel. We are the house of God. And when Jesus makes his claim on our lives, when he changes us in the Holy Spirit, our lives are now the stone, the house of God, which proclaims to the world who this God is. 
So what do I mean when I say that we need to ascend the, uh, when I say we need to set up the stone? I mean that when we belong to Jesus, from here to eternity, our goal, our purpose, our mission in life is to make God look good. It is to live our lives in holiness. It is to tell others of his work in us. It is to show the love of God to a hurting world. It is to rely on his grace so that in every situation, both public and private, we would display and proclaim the glory and the goodness of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We need to set up the stone of our life so that people will look at us and see Jesus. Folks, it's a tall order. So tall that we couldn't possibly do it on our own. But we can make it to that scenic overlook. We can make it through a changed life. And heaven before us. But it can only happen by the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. So regardless of where you are at, whatever you've done, Jesus is inviting you today to come to him the stairway to heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that a changed life and an eternity with you is not some impossible ladder or stairway that we need to climb, but rather all of that work is accomplished through your son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that it has nothing to do with what we've done, how good we are, how smart we are, how uh, the wonderful things that we have done, but only because Jesus has done the work for us. So, Father, help us to place our trust in this stairway to heaven. Help us to go to Jesus and be led to a new life. I pray for those that may have been wandering away for a while, Lord, that you would indeed be drawing them back to you this morning. Father, I pray for those that are here that may never have heard this, this message of Jesus freely going and, and being the righteousness for us, for dying on the cross for our sins, being raised to show his power and his victory over sin and death and, and now reigning and ruling with you. Not because of how wonderful we are, but in spite of what we are as sinners. Lord, would you change hearts this morning? And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. For more information about our church, you can find us on the web at www.emmanuelmora.com or on Facebook by searching for Emmanuel Mora. If you like what you've heard, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to partner with us in our mission, consider giving financially to our ministry. You can conveniently give right from your mobile device by texting any word to 320-313-1950. There are options for one-time giving or recurring gifts on a schedule that you set. Thanks again for listening. Emmanuel Mora, Knowing Christ and Making Him Known